Uh, the math in interest group will be presenting the Collatz conjecture. Uh, this conjecture relies on simple arithmetic and is easy to follow. Um, many well math mathematicians have looked into this conjecture using tools from number theory to just about every field of mathematics, yet after 85 years, it has still eluded a proof. Um, so, you know, the talk will state the conjecture, present some approaches taken, and give partial results obtained. Um, you know, this will be followed by a question and answer session. Um, <clears throat> if you'd like to make a comment or have a question during the talk, please put it in the chat and I'll monitor that. And, uh, uh, and I'll, we'll, try to, we'll try to answer those questions during the talk. Uh, I'm going to try to share a screen here. Okay, can people see the whole screen? Yep, we got it. Yes. Okay. And okay, so I can advance it. All right. <clears throat> The original source for this talk was a YouTube video I watched in the fall of 2021. It would have been a candidate talk, but I found somebody for December. Uh, the scheduled speaker for February turned out not to be ready in time. So we're jumping in with this talk here. I'm not a mathematician in the sense of somebody with PhD doing research. Uh, number theory in general is my least favorite area, but it's nevertheless a very interesting topic. Uh, numerous sources were used. The YouTube video, which I will mail out later. Plus, as I was putting this talk together, I found a bunch of other uh, YouTube videos, plus also quite a number of books that are written about it as well. Um, I also used Wikipedia references, slides, and papers from renowned mathematicians working on this problem. So, uh, <clears throat> what I will do is I will state the collect conjecture. I'll delve into the investigations taken by mathematicians. I'll show some of the results of the progress made over the years, uh, show some of the interesting parallels uncovered, show some of the dilemmas surrounding a valid proof, and summarize the current status. Uh, the, the way, um, okay, a little bit of history. Uh, it was formulated by a German mathematician, Lothar Kollatz, in 1937. Uh, he, along with Ulrich Sinogovitz, founded the field of spectral graph theory. I sort of read into this that in the process of looking into spectral graph theory, he discovered this conjecture. And it was privately mentioned to other mathematicians at conferences. Um, however, he never published it. And it was published years later. And since other mathematicians have come forward, he's been given, you know, mentioned that he mentioned it in at conferences, he gets credit for it. However, many other mathematicians have independently arrived at the same conjecture. And this conjecture has many alter alternative names. One is the Ulam conjecture. Kakutani's problem, Thwaites conjecture, Haas's algorithm, Syracuse problem, uh, three plus one conjecture slash problem, hailstone sequence numbers, and wondrous numbers. And the renowned mathematician Paul Erdish has stated, mathematics is not ripe enough for such questions. <laughs> okay, so what are the rewards for this? Well, for one, it's a purely intellectual challenge. Uh, Martin Gardner, who wrote the Scientific American column, uh, it's basically that type of problem. And he did actually write about it in that column. Um, <clears throat> it's a simple but non-trivial toy model of a dynamical system. People have written papers just on this aspect of it, and it may lead to a better understanding of dyna dynamical models. Um, it's a benchmark for testing our current understanding of number theory. Uh, proof attempts have been linked to many other areas of mathematics, affine maps, differential equations, fractals, Turing machines. There is a modest cash prize. Uh, Harold Coxeter um, 
will pay $50 for a proof. He'll pay $100 to find a counterexample. Paul Erdish put up $500, and Sir Brian Thwaites put up 1,000 pounds. And of course, there's the bragging rights for whoever finds a variable proof. OK, a little bit of a preliminary here. Uh, for any arbitrary, arbitrary positive integer n, um, apply the following rule. If the number is odd, multiply by 3 and add 1. If the number is even, divide by 2. OK, and um, in modular arithmetic, uh, um, modular arithmetic notation, uh, they talk about a modulus. And a modulus is really the number that the number is being divide, divided by. So when you see mod 2, the divisor is 2. When you see x with this triple equal sign equals 1, that means uh, modular arithmetic only cares about the remainder. So here, this means that the remainder is 1. And x triple equals 0 means the remainder is 0. So in the first case, it's an odd number. In the second case, it's an even number. So, um, so they define a function called the Kalas function. So c of x is equal to 3x plus 1 if it's odd, and x over 2 if it's equal. And let's form a sequence by repeatedly applying this rule. So a number a sub k will equal x if k is 0. And uh, recursively applying the Kalas function for k larger than 0. And if you notice the superscript k is in parentheses, that's the differentiated from exponentiation. And, and, and so it means recursion. And so here's an example. a sub k is equal to c superscript k of x. And it's just k iterations of um, the collapse function, nested. OK. Now, there is a shortcut that mathematicians use. And uh, since 3 plus x is even, whenever x is odd, the shortcut form of the function um, simply divides by 2 when it's odd. And when it's even, it stays x over 2. OK, the conjecture as a statement says that the 3x plus 1 problem uh, that for every positive integer m greater than, greater or equal to 1, that some iterate t of k given m is equal to 1. So all sequences will eventually converge to 1. And, and this, and the proof of this has been what's been so elusive. Okay, a little bit of definition here. Um, INF refers to in fit mum of a set of elements uh, which has the greatest lower bound of that set. Okay. Um, you know, we talk about a sequence, but often the mathematicians refer to it as a tra trajectory or forward orbit of an integer m in the set. And here's the set m, the first iteration t, the second iteration t, the third iteration t, so on. And they refer to it by O with a little superscript plus sign here. Uh, there are a lot of parameters they like to look at. One is the stopping time. So stopping time is given by sigma, given initial m. And so it's um, t recursions, looking for the least m that satisfies the fact that you'll eventually hit a number in the sequence that's less than this original starting number. And the reason this is useful, because if you hit a number less than the original uh, starting value, you can use an earlier sequence uh, that has been found that already started with a lower number. OK, and of course, if it never terminates, then it would be infinity. OK, the total stopping time is just given by when it finally does reach its final value of 1. OK, and since this number can be very large, they like to scale it by dividing through by the logarithmic log function. And so they call this the gamma value. 
and they also find some other parameters like the height and and the path. I'm not going to go into them right now. Okay, so here's a simple example. Um, the input value is okay. Let me just go back one. Um, uh, Uh, you know, anybody that's looking, for, you know, through the research papers, you'll find out that C of X and T of X are the form used in many papers written, but you won't find them on the wiki page. And if you're interested uh, in reading some of the papers written on it, the variables X and N get used interchangeably and the term sequence, sequence and orbits gets used interchangeably. Okay, so here we have a short sequence. For n equals 12, we apply the function c of n uh, repetitively until we reach 1. So 12 turns to 6, turns to 3, 10, 5, 16, 8, 2, 8, 4, 2, 1. So the length of the sequence is 10. And uh, the numbers that are in bold are the odd numbers. So you can see that how often the when it's an odd number, it, may, it means it, um, it will raise in value with the next number. And if it's even, it falls in value with the next number. Um, the, the maximum value obtained for this uh, starting point is 16. It does reach its final value. The length was 10. However, also note that there's a trivial cycle involved when you get to one and you apply 3x plus 1, it brings you back to 4, which brings you to 2, back to 1 again. So that's shown in this little diagram here. So they call this the trivial cycle, and it's present in all sequences that reach to 1. So um, what mathematicians are looking for is if there's any non-trivial cycles that are uh, not part of the, uh, the you know, this 4, 2, 1, uh, convergence. Okay, if, if you look at the graph, it starts off at 12, it drops, then raises to some peak, drops again, raises to a higher peak, and finally converges to one here. Um, so we apply a slightly longer example, input equals 27. Uh, this results in a length of 24. Again, all the odd numbers have been highlighted. Uh, made, made in bold. Uh, the maximum value obtained is 92.32, so it's a fairly high number here, given such a small seed number. Oops. And um, um, and this is what the graph looks like. So there's some similarities to the first graph. In other words, it reached the peak, and then it dropped down, and then it reached a higher peak before finally converging to one. Now, there's a reason they call these the hailstone numbers is because with larger and larger number, seed numbers, uh, the values can really oscillate between very high values and very low values. And it's typical the way hail develops inside a thunderhead. Uh, there's huge convection currents going from 10,000 feet up to 30,000 feet. And a water droplet forming at the top will freeze and drop to 10,000 feet, pick up more moisture, and the convection currents will bring it back up to 10, 30,000, where it freezes and gets bigger. And it goes through multiple cycles until it gets heavy enough to rain down on the ground. But it does eventually fall to the ground, just like these sequences do to one. OK, so when mathematicians look at this conjecture, there are certain things they like to investigate. Uh, one is the number of steps it took for n to reach one. Maybe there's some kind of pattern or limit to it. Uh, the starting value n having the greatest stopping distance while less than 10 to some integer. Um, the numbers with total stopping time longer than that of any other smaller stopping value. Um, starting values with the maximum trajectory point that's greater in any smaller starting value. Um, 
they, they like to also visualize um, a subset of some starting number n. Uh, they put them into something called directed graphs of orbits, let's say for the first m numbers. Um, they'll plot the starting value versus the largest numbers reached in the trajectory going toward one. Uh, they'll show a, pre, a tree representation for the starting numbers of less than uh, some k steps. They'll plot the number versus the iterations to get from one to the first hundred million numbers. And then another way of, that they like to look at it is they look at heuristic probability. So they take a, a you know some set of numbers, and these numbers are obviously increasing when they're odd by you know the three x plus one, but they're decreasing when they're even because they're divided by two. And they're looking to see heuristically what the average probability is. Is it increasing, decreasing, or what happens? They're looking at heuristically the stopping times, and they're looking at the lower bound of the maximum numbers reached in the trajectory. OK. Um, OK, let's look at the imperial data Okay, for numbers the numbers of steps for n to reach one for inputs, n equals one, two, three, let's say up to m. Okay, so the result of that is one, since it's already at one, has zero steps, two will take one step to reach one, three will take seven steps to reach uh, one, four will take two steps to reach one, and so on. So. This has actually been computed out to some large number, and the sequence can be found in the online Encyclopedia of Integer Sequences. Uh, you know, um, in conversations with Al Aho, I, he mentioned uh, the, um, this resource, and it was created by Neil Sloan of Bell Labs and still maintained by him, and it's useful for both professional and amateur mathematicians, and it's still main for, maintained for number theoretic researchers by Neil Sloan. Um, and if you were to click on this link, you would, well, actually, I didn't mean to click on it. Uh, okay, so here it is. Uh, here's the sequence that I have on the view graph, and it tells you at the beginning what it's trying to do. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a comment section, gives you a little program how they use to compute it, and so on. So, this is available for researchers um, investigating this problem. Okay, so um, the other thing is they can look at the starting value having the largest stopping time given less than some uh, exponent to the you know, power of 10. So let's say it's 10 to the one. Uh, so for numbers between zero and nine, it turns out nine is the number that has the largest number of steps, which is 19. If, there, if it's 10 to the two, between one and 99, Turns out 97 is the one that has the largest number of steps, which is 118. If you're looking at 10 to the three, that's 1,000. One to 999, it turns out 871 is the number that has the largest number of steps, 178. OK, so uh, with numbers with a total stopping time that's longer than any of the smaller starting values forming a sequence width. And to give you the sequence, uh, this is of interest because um, well, okay, this is just another parameter they like to look at, and the starting values whose maximum trajectory point is greater than that of any smaller starting value. So they're looking to see how the maximum trajectory is increasing as the larger numbers are getting larger. 
Okay. The other thing I like to do is I like to visualize what's happening. So rather than doing a forward sequence or a forward orbit, they're looking at a backward orbit starting from the root number one. So if you look at the graph on the right, at the very bottom, everything coalesces to one. So the bottom dot here is one. One before it is two, four, eight, and then it branches out in, into a tree-like formation. And for instance, a seed number could be this, you know, this number right here, and it takes this path and eventually joins other sequences and joins other sequences until finally it gets to the final two, four, one loop. And um, however, people notice that if you modify the graph, you take the odd numbers and angle them to the left 20 degrees, you take even, even directed lines and angle them to the right by eight degrees, you can get these very nice looking structures that look almost like um, coral or seagrass. And uh, I took this from an interactive video, which I sent a link out. You know, some of you may have played around with that. Um, now, the other thing they looked at is the starting value versus the largest number in the trajectory. And so this graph here is from zero to, I think it's 10,000 and it goes up to 100,000 and you can st start to see some sort of regular pattern. So maybe by looking at this pattern, they gain some insight into how to prove this conjecture. Uh, the other thing they do is they take a tree representation of numbers of less than some arbitrary number of steps, in this case, 20 steps, and they put it into a graph and it has sort of an amazing symmetry to it. Maybe there's something about this that'll give them an edge in looking you know, trying to come up with a proof. Uh, there's another way they can visualize it. They plot the number versus iterations, uh, the seed number versus the number of iterations for the first 100 million numbers. So here it is from zero to 100 million. And the number of iterations to get to one is on this axis. And I mean, there's some outliers up here, but it sort of seems to level off, you know, at about 700. And it seems to be sort of equally distributed. And there is a mathematician that did uh, prove that this follows a uniform distribution. Okay, how about heuristic probability? The numbers are increasing when they're odd, 3x plus one. Uh, and when they're even, they're decreasing by division of two. So if you look on the number scale, there's an even number of odd and equal numbers to choose from initially. And let's say they're odd, the sequence uh, goes by three, but because um, uh, but it's cut in half when it's even. Now, if you look at this graph here, you notice the top numbers are all odd numbers. They go from one, three, five, seven, all the way up to 27. Um, applying three X plus one to the odd numbers always results in an even number. So the next number in the row, they're all even. So it grows by, on the average three, well, it grows by three X plus one divided by two. And for large numbers that can be reduced to three over two. Um, now, if you look, at the um, <clears throat> okay, so if you look at the next line, um, fifty percent of the time, the odd numbers turn back to even. Okay, so, so here's 5, 11, 17, 23, 29, 35, 41. And if you look, look at the next line, um, so 25% of the time, they turn, turn to odd, 1, 7, 13, 19. And at the next step, 12%, 12.5% 12 
turn to odd, and the next time, six six and a quarter percent turn to odd, and so on. And if you try to compute this as a geometric mean, um, you get three over two to the one half, three over four to the one quarter, three over eight to the one eighth, and so on. And if you and it doesn't take very long for this uh, sequence to converge to three quarters or 0.75. So heuristically, you can say that 3x plus one sequences are more likely to shrink than grow. So chances are that they won't go to the infinity and, and it helps support the notion that they'll eventually reach and converge to one. Now, the other thing they like to look at is stopping times. So they look at whether the generated sequence has a finite stopping time. And there's some almost all proofs that have shown that to be true, but not, but not for, they can't prove it for every number. Okay, and another heuristic that they look at is the lower bound on the maximum numbers in the trajectory. So they try a scatter plot of started numbers versus sequence numbers in each trajectory. For every three plus one sequence, there's a number that's smaller than the seed. Or if it can be shown that there's a number smaller than the seed, then they would have proven the Collatz conjecture. And whatever seed gets picked, it will eventually get smaller. And that smaller number can be used as a seed to another sequence, which will get even smaller. So they're looking at this bound. So they have, here's the seed, and here's the number reached. And they have this line, y equals x. And, if, and they're looking to see what the scatter plot looks like. And it looks like these numbers are below this line. And, and the graph on the right just says, you pick a number, if you, if you hit a, if the sequence hits a number that turns out to be the seed of another sequence number, you have shown that it will eventually converge to one. So, um, and I'll get back into a little bit, bit more depth later on whether this y equals x value can be improved upon. Okay, there's another heuristic that they uh, use. You know, let's take a very large number, you know, uh, n equals 72 million and change. Here's a graph on the right of what it looks like. You know, it sort of oscillates around a bit. It hits a very high peak of uh, 9 billion and change before it slowly drops down by iteration 30 to a very low number, but it sort of stays there until step 90, 197 when it finally does reach one. So if they take the sequence and they just apply the logarithm to it, this is what they get the graph on the right. So it's a downward slope and it looks like just random perturbations of a line. Now if they take the slope and they normalize it, um, you know they, they essentially get what looks like a random walk. Uh, so this might be of some use in getting a sequence. Now the other thing they looked at from a heuristic point of view is they looked at the leading digit of each number in the sequence. So for example, for n equals three, that goes to 10, 5, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. And you just take the first digit. So three, the one from the 10, five, the one from the 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. And let's say, let's generate the sequences for all starting values up to 1 billion. And let's use those sequences to build up a histogram for the occurrence of each digit from one to nine. So by far, one is the most prevalent digit. So one is roughly 30% um, of the digits, two is about eight, 17%, three is about 12%. And so it follows this curve. Well, people have seen this curve before and it's called Benford's law. Okay, um, to look at Benford's law a little bit more closely, um, 
it's basically due to picking uniformly from a logarithmic scale. And the question is, can it be used to tell if the sequence goes to one? So that's why they look, look at it. So here's a logarithmic scale. You can see the interval between one and two, the leading um, digit would be one. Between two and three, the leading digit would be two, but, but they get shorter and shorter. And if the, if, the, if the quantity of numbers is large enough and they cover many orders of magnitude, their distribution may follow this curve on the left. And, you can, and red is the one where the first digit is a one and blue is the case where the first digit is an eight. You can see that the occurrence of the first digit being one is far more prevalent than the other digits. And it only breaks apart if the distribution doesn't cover much more than um, you know, one order of magnitude. And, and especially depending how the distribution falls, it may fall off right where it hits the one and therefore um, if there's, if there's an, isn't a large enough sample size, uh, you, you won't get, you won't observe this effect. But this can be seen in all kinds of places. For instance, take the first digit of populations in, of countries. So this is represented by the graph on the left. You can take the first digit of physical constants. You can see a similar curve. First digit of the market cap of NASDAQ companies is a similar curve. Take the first digit of the first 10, 100,000 Fibonacci numbers, similar curve. Um, it's also been said you can use it to detect fraud and financial statements. So if you're investing in a stock, you could look at the numbers on the, on the annual report and run it, run it through and see if it follows Benford's law. If not, they might be cooking their books. So anyway, so let's move on. So the other thing people have done is they've looked at alternative formulations. So Helmut Hasse in 1975 worked with a generalized function T of X. And rather than using constants, he used variables. So um, it's MX plus F of R divided by D. And the modulus is now also a function of D. And and this work inspired Jean-Paul Alouche in 1979, who modified it a little bit further, okay? And, um, and a part that I haven't put into the talk is people have actually changed this equation and made it an equivalent equation of sines and cosines, and they've turned it into, uh, an equation using complex numbers and they've applied fractals to it. But I don't have that in the talk, but there's a video I'll be sending out that will go into that. Um, now, you know, given these generalizations, you know, one reason for doing this is to find classes of functions that, you know, one may converge and other ones may not. And maybe there's some insight that can be gotten from looking at classes of functions. So one thing they noticed is if you pick 5x plus one mod two, that this function will have sequences whose orbits go to infinity. So right away, if this happens to be a conjecture, you can easily prove it by a false by a counter example. The other thing, uh, the conjecture only works with positive integers. Well, what happens if you use neg negative integers? Well, it turns out if, um, very quickly with very low numbers, you can find three sequences that um, are, are uh, non, that are uh, non-trivial loops that loop upon themselves and are disjoint from anything else in the tree. So the one first loop is from minus one to minus two, back to one again. The other one's from minus five, looping all the way through back to minus, five again, and the third one is at minus 17, looping all the way through to back to minus 17. So they found those real easily. So obviously, um, one of the trick maybe is um, 
Now, people have also changed this function to be 3x minus 1, and I think that came up with the same three loops. So one of the things they might, would be looking at to see is, is there a property that 3x plus 1 has that 3x minus 1 doesn't have that can be used to prove this conjecture? So here are some partial results, OK? Um, from 1963 to 2009, there have been 330 plus papers published. Um, I had sent out a link to two papers that are the annotated bibliography of those papers, one covering from 63 to 1999, and the other one from 2000 to 2009. And they were done by Jeffrey Legarius. He happened to be at AT&T Bell Labs I guess early in his career, he's now at University of Michigan. He attends conferences actually that work on the conjecture as well as keeping track of all the papers and proofs that have come up, okay? A number of proofs have been claimed, but these proofs have gaps. Um, Yamamata in 1980 gave a proof, but people looking at it says there's a gap. Karl Heinz Metzger, in 1995, gave a proof. Uh, people said there was a gap. He attempted to fix that gap with another paper in 99. They looked at it again and said, well, there's still a gap. And he came out with another paper. And I guess it still didn't quite satisfy a verifiable proof. And I guess he hasn't tried anything further after that. Uh, there's Yang Sheng Ki, 1990, uh, 2005, Carl's. Cadogan in 2006, Paul Buckman in 2008. And of course, when I was researching this, I came across a book in Amazon where this person tried to get his paper published and they rejected it for some reason. And he decided to put it in a book and it's, you can buy it on Amazon right now. But as of now, I, I don't think anybody's really reviewed this. Uh, this is uh, Kawasaki Iwayuki in 2021. And there's a person in uh, Riho Terrace in 1976 who came up with an almost all theorem, obviously doesn't claim to be a proof, but this is what people look at and try to improve upon to see if they can get it to be an all proof. Uh, there, there are a couple of distri distributed computing projects by Oliveira E. Silva, Silva, so I guess these are two people, uh, Eric Rosenthal um, of Netherlands and Barina, who's, who gave the latest contribution. And in, by 20, um, it was verified in 2020 that the Collax conjecture for starting values of n up to three times 10 to the 20, uh, you know, converged to one. And of course, that number is this very long number here. Whoops. And if you want to look at the history of the progress they made, you can look at this website, which has all the effort, catalogs all the efforts by all the people and the largest number of n they've computed it to. So they keep adding to this website as they make more progress. So being that they're up to such large numbers, it's very unlikely a counterexample can be found by pen and paper. Um, there is this one person that did a paper, it says the conjecture could fail if a non-trivial repeating cycle could be found. And Shalom Ilahu in 1993 stated that should such a cycle exist, the cycle period P must have length of at least 7 million and change. And the equation they have is this um, P equals, so it's a constant coefficient times A plus a constant coefficient times B plus a constant coefficient times C. That's what they came up with. And A, B, and C have to be non-negative integers. B has to be at least one or, or greater than one. And at least A or C have to be equal to zero. So if A or Z, C are both zero and B has to be one, then this cycle will wind up to be this middle term, you know, 7 million and change. Um, 
there's another partial results on the lower bound, uh, Ilya Kosakoff and Jeff Lagarius in 2003 came up with a computer aided proof. And that basically showed that the number of integers in the interval of one to X that eventually reach one is at least equal to X to the point raised to the uh, 0.841 power for all sufficiently large X. Um, all right, so partial results regarding stopping time. So Riho Terrace 1976, that I mentioned them before. So he used the distribution of parity vectors in the central limit theorem to show that almost all initial values of n eventually iterate to a value less than n to the one. So in other words, just n. So if it were all, this implies Okay, so if it was all, this implies a collapse conjecture by further iteration. So almost all in mathematics is defined as all but a negligible amount. And negligible amount depends on the context being used and it can mean either finite, countable, or null. Um, Jean-Paul Alouche in 1979 uh, improved on this. So almost all initial values of n eventually reach an iterated value of n to the 0 0.869. Ivan Korik in 1994 improved on that and said that um, they all iterate to a value of at least n to the 0 0.7925. And the latest person to look at this, and there's quite a gap here, is Terence Tao, 2019. He used logarithmic density to show that almost all initial values of n eventually iterate to less than a function n for any n, provided that the limit as x goes to infinity, that f of x goes, goes to, uh, will go to infinity. So what that means is you can grow x as slowly, f of x as slowly as you want. So for instance, since log of x goes to infinity, as n x goes to infinity, you can have f of n equals log of log of log of log x as many times as you want. So it's getting closer to a proof, but it's still not quite there. Okay, um, another partial result is that John Conway in 1987 invented a computer language called Fractran. Fractran, um, I believe stands for fraction translation. So there's a list of fractions, f1, f2, up to fk, and some starting integer n. And there's a sequence, n uh, sub n, where n naught is equal to the first integer, and every subsequent integer is equal to uh, one of the fractions, f sub i, times um, the current integer to get to the next integer, where uh, I is some number between one and K. And I has to be the least I for which the product, uh, the fraction times the integer is integral. And by that, I think he means an, an integer and as long as I exists. Now I had a little bit of trouble working this out from the paper. And, um, but then I saw another reference to it. And I think what, the process that's being used is you try the first fraction. If that doesn't work, you try the next one. If that doesn't work, you try the next one. And you keep trying it until you find one that results in an integer. And when you do, that's the integer you use. And that becomes the input to the next iteration. So every program is a variant of the collapse function. You know, how nice, maybe you could use this to prove it. Uh, Fractran can be shown to be Turing complete. So this implies that Fractran can be used to simulate any Turing machine. And of course, anything that can be simulated in a Turing machine can be, can be executed on any computer. And, um, and they also were shown that some Fractran programs 
are undecidable. So there's some that are decidable, there are other ones that are undecidable. And by that, it means whether it will reach some target value and not. And this is also related to the halting problem for the Turing machines. So, um, you know, just to do a little bit of review on computational complexity theory, um, you know, a decision problem is a yes and no question that is defined on an infinite set. And the example is a halting problem, is a problem of determining uh, given an arbitrary Turing machine M and an input X, whether M will halt on X, on input X. Okay, Alan Turing proved that there's no algorithm to solve the halting problem. The domain of halting problem is the infinite set of pairs, M, uh, uh, pairs of M and X. An algorithm is a computer program that halts on all inputs. Okay, so the Collatz problem can be formulated as a decision problem given an arbitrary positive integer n. So the question is, does the iterated Collatz function on integer n converge to one? So uh, is there an algorithm to decide on this decision problem? And then the solution to this decision problem appears to be unknown. So, um, so what I've done is I've stated what the Collatz conjecture is. I've delved into investigations taken by mathematicians, you know, using empirical data visualizations, heuristic probability. I've showed some of the results of progress being made, improvements in lower bounds and stopping time, showed some of the interesting parallels uncovered, Benford's law, random walk, structures in nature, Turing machines, showed some dilemmas surrounding a valid proof. Uh, the almost all proofs are about as close as one can get currently and and you know so on so the conclusions um, we can say that heuristics and the almost all proofs provide some confidence that a valid proof may still be found however you can't rule out a counter example there may be some disjoint sequence separate from the directed graph there may be a sequence that won't reach one and the third is no known algorithm can decide on the Collet problem. And um, I, I want to mention two people. One is Paul Erdish, and the other one is Terence Tao. Uh, they turn out to be both uh, child prodigies. Uh, Paul Erdish, at the age of three, uh, discovered numbers. And at the age of four, he invented negative numbers. And from the ages of like 17 to 21, he was in the university and got his PhD in math. And he's basically a number theorist. Um, he never had any children, but he called children epsilon and grandchildren epsilon squared. Uh, Terence Tao is also a child prodigy. Here he's shown at age 10 in 1985. Uh, at age nine, he was taking university courses somewhere between the ages of 14 to 21, he was in the university. And by 21, he had his PhD in math. And so he was one of the latest contributors. And apparently, um, I guess early on in his life, he, he was able to um, uh, have Paul Erdish help him, I guess, teach him parts of math. So, um, you know, the thing on the right, you know, the, uh, the cartoon in the top, people think they solved it. Here's the Collatz conjecture. But at the moment, the best they can do is almost all theorems. And so the current state of math is holding them back from actually finding, proving the Collatz conjecture. So here's some of the contributors to mathematics. This is a Collatz Conjecture Conference. It was in August of 1999 in Eichstätt University in Germany. And here's the list of attendees, which are shown in the photo. And some of the names that I've come across in, in some of the papers is Gunther Rishing, Jeffrey Lagaris, Mark Chamberlain, Eric Usendahl, and so on. Um, and here's uh, some of the people referenced 
you know, Collatz was the original formulator of the conjecture. Uh, Ulam, it's also named after Ulam. Uh, Kakutani, uh, Brian Thwaites, Helmut Hasse, and here's Frank Benford, Jr. He was an electrical engineer and physicist. He worked at the Optical Measurements Lab at the G General Electric Research Lab, and he's the one that came up with that distribution. Uh, here's Jeffrey Lagaris, who is the person who is maintaining the list of papers and uh, worked on this for years. Uh, Riho Terrace, um, I couldn't find an image for him or couldn't find an image that I could conclusively say was him because it's such a common name, it could be somebody else. Here is Terence Tao. Uh, he, he, um, he's currently at 40, age 46. And, you know, he's, he's one of the premier mathematicians. Uh, here's John Conway. He did a lot of interesting things in game theory, finite groups, number theory. He invented the game of life program. Um, sadly, he died away in March of 2020 due to COVID. Um, here's Alex Kontorovich. He's at, you know, he claims he's spent 20 years looking at this. And um, he's at Rutgers University. And here's a photo of Paul Erdish. And um, so, you know, he worked on graph and number theory, probability theory, and so many other areas that you know, too numerous to list. Um, I gave some book references. Jeff Legarius wrote The Ultimate Challenge, 3x plus one problem. You can get it on Amazon. Gunter Wirsching wrote The Dynamical System Generated by 3n plus one function. Also, you can order this from Amazon. And then there's some other people who I don't really know. Uh, there's the ultimate book of Collat sequences. I guess they're just printed. These are all by indie publishers, independent publishers, how to prove the Collat conjecture. I guess some hints. Um, proof of the Collat conjecture, uh, you know, if, uh, probably one that has gaps in it. And of course, the latest person who couldn't get his paper paper published, published a book, Two Proofs of the Collapse Conjecture, and nobody's reviewed it yet. And here are some of the references that I sent out in the email. I've added more. So if you get the new updated email, you'll see more references. And that's the end. There was one question Thad asked, uh, why was 3x plus one picked and not 2x plus one or 5x plus one? Well, I already covered 5x plus one. It fails. I don't know about 2x plus one. Um, uh, Mark asked uh, leading digit idea. What about other bases, octal? Um, yeah, that's an interesting question. I'm not sure if I can answer that, but I would presume it would still work. Um, let me just go to do we have any hands raised or anybody want to jump in and ask a question or have a comment? Uh, this is Bill here. I've actually got a bunch of questions and comments. Um, I'll let other people cut in between. But related to Thad G's question, um, you know, why 3x plus 1, et cetera, uh, the broader question is what were these mathematicians, Ulam and Kolatz, et cetera, working on when this idea came to them. I don't think they just woke up in the morning and said, hey, let's see what happens if I do this thing with 3x plus 1 or blah, blah, blah. Uh, they must have been do some context they were working. Was there any indication of that in your readings? Well, the only context I can say is, uh, you know, being that Collatz worked with spectral graph theory, I believe he was, if, if you go on the wiki page and look what spectral graph theory is all about, you'll see um, he's mapping out sort of directed graphs in a way. I mean, they're sort of three-dimensional. And maybe in consequence of investigating that, he found the sequence and says, hey, this thing converges to one. You okay. know, it must have been like serendipity. Now, as far as Ulam, I can't really say. I mean, he, he delved into so many different areas. You know, if I go on Wikipedia, um, he was sitting 
listening to a very boring talk and he was wind up doodling on paper and he drew this rectangular spiral that kept going out and out and he started uh, putting numbers on it and he noticed that all the prime numbers were on the diagonals and there's something called the Ulam spiral now and uh, so these mathematicians are always doodling doing something <laughs> you know <laughs> coming up with things that nobody else would think of. So, you know. so I, I can add a few interesting things about Ulam. Uh, he wrote a book a number of years ago called Adventures of a Mathematician, which is about his early days in math in Poland and then coming to the US and teaching. And he was at Los Alamos working um, on the atom bomb and then the hydrogen bomb, et cetera. Um, worked a lot with John von Neumann, who was a very good friend of his. But uh, among the things that he's done that are a little bit off the wall, maybe um, at some point, uh, he actually claims to have invented the idea of Monte Carlo simulation because due to an illness, he was in the hospital for a while and he kept playing solitaire and he says, okay, now I wanna prove, I wanna know what's the probability of winning the game. And he tried to go through the combinatorics and gave up and said, the best way to do it is just play millions of games and see what the probability is. So that was the, he claims the initial thing with Monte Carlo simulation. And then he worked with that on that with uh, John von Neumann a lot more. But yeah, that's, yeah the, the, uh, the Monte Carlo simulation is attributed to him on the wiki page. Yeah. So that uh, is listed. But um, if you, you want a, a really nice light read that uh, has a lot of interesting things in it, uh, read his book, Adventures of a Mathematician. I hope it's still in print. If not, maybe you can get it from the library. It's, it's a very fast read. Uh, it's almost half about John von Neumann, as I recall, who was a very good friend of his. Okay. I'd like to I'd like to just mention that uh, there's a movie uh, called Adventures of a Mathematician about Ulam, and I saw it recently. I don't I don't know when it came out, not not just now. Uh, I saw it and I recommend it. Um, of course, it doesn't go deeply into the math, but it does go deeply into the moral dilemmas of mathematicians in the atomic age. And uh, I enjoyed the movie, but I also felt it made some very serious points. So I want to recommend it. Adventures of a Mathematician, and it's about Ulam. Where did you see that? Was it then some streaming service? Uh, yeah, I I watched it on a service called Canopy, which is a free streaming service that you can get using your library card. Yes, I know about that. Uh, yeah, I will certainly look for that. <laughs> um, okay. Um, also, in the comment, uh, Al Aho mentioned that consulting. The online database of integers is an easy way to answer questions of the form. What's the next number in the sequence? And you can just give it any sequence and it'll tell you like what equation or what methodology came up with that. So, you know, people doing research papers say, oh, I got the sequence. I wonder how I can reduce this, you know? So. Um, I might also mention it's a great way to solve homework problems. <laughs> Yeah. When you're given uh, the first n terms of a sequence and get asked what's the next term, uh, it's a trivial way of solving such problems. Yeah, they, they put those problems sometimes in the daily papers. Yes. Know, like the parade magazine. Anyway. <laughs> I, I remember them being in the, like the GREs in math and in the, some of the SAT questions, that, that, but they were usually pretty easy to solve. Um, Anyway, just another comment on the actual mathematical problem. Uh, you know, as you pointed out that if you get to four, if you get to one, you wind up then in four, two, one. Uh, so if you get to four, you've got convergence to one. If you get to eight, because you divide by two, you get to one. If you get to 16, you get, you keep going. And if you get to any power of two, it will then cascade down to one. Mm -hmm. So, and I think, that's the only way it's going to happen. Eventually, you have to get to a power of two. So I think that I would suspect that the um, problem is equivalent to, can this sequence ever get to a power of two? And was that in any of the things you read or are there any mathematicians trying to look at that as a different way to approach the problem? 
not trying to get to one, but to get to a power of two. Yeah, I, I didn't actually see anything in that. I mean, you could check the papers listed in, in the two uh, bibliographies by Ligarius. Um, but I actually, it seemed like if I look at the, you know, the tree graph of the sequences that they had, it seems like everything converged to, I think, at least eight, you know, and then there was nothing that converged to, you know, joined at two or four. So I think everything at least came down to converging to eight, you know, joining at eight before in the tree of sequences. So, but I don't recall seeing a paper that uh, looked at that. Because it might be interesting to see if there's a way to get a sequence that is never going to reach a power of two. Just, you know, just try to work back what sequence is, is you know, 16. How do you get to 16 without going to another power of two first? So there's examples of that. It's, it's a way to play around with it in my mind. Well, the other interesting thing is, you know, the people that used um, complex numbers wind up with, and they graph what they have, they wind up with um, fractal images on, on, a, on a plane. And, you know, the nature of fractals is you see some detail and you zoom into that detail and you see another repetition of, of the same pattern and you zoom into a piece of that and you see the repetition again. And so, you know, maybe it could be proved by that method because the patterns are just going to be endlessly repeating and there won't ever be a break in the pattern. But I, I haven't seen anything, you know, anything that says that this could be a proof or this is a way to go about really doing it. Walt, I presume what you meant by the term um, a gap is a, a bug in the proof of the theorem. Yeah, it's a bug. What they do is they'll state something, but it's more heuristic than than a step-by-step uh, -step verifiable proof. And therefore they say, well, okay, it looks like it could be true, but it's not really, that little gap hasn't been proven yet. Um, but since I haven't looked at the papers, I haven't looked at the gaps and, you know. So anybody that feels real adventurous, they can look at that bibliography and <laughs> try to, you know, round up some of the papers and take it a step further. But well, um, Your talk reminds me that there are a huge number of papers that purport to prove that the complexity class P is equal to the complexity class NP, the celebrated P versus NP problem, for which the claim Mathematics Institute has a $1 million prize if you can solve it. It's the most celebrated open problem in theoretical computer science. And there have been maybe scores, perhaps hundreds of papers that have proven that P equals NP and uh, maybe a similar number that's have proven that P is not equal to NP. And there's a website that lists these papers. Oh, now, yeah. <laughs> of course, all these papers have what you would call gaps. I call them bugs because no, none of the theorems is true. <coughs> well, actually, it's Ligarius that calls them gaps. I guess he's being very polite about it. <laughs> but uh, anyway. So Jim Landward, do you have any comments or insight on this? Uh, you have to unmute yourself. Yeah, I'm unmuted now. Well, it's interesting. I guess I'd heard of it briefly as, or at some point as the Ulam conjecture. It's really not, uh, you know, it was not my kind of thing to, uh, to deal with it. Uh, you know, it's interesting to have known a few of these people like Jeff Ligarius and, and Erdish used to come around Bell Labs periodically with Ron Graham. And uh, uh, I, I recognize the name Kakatani. I think I had a math professor in college who was probably that, not, I didn't have him, but he was there. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, but I, uh, I don't know what he did. Uh, I guess... Uh, 
no real insights. Uh, if people like to play with these things, that's great. But uh... well, I, I um, well, I guess mathematicians are warned not to spend too much time with it. So, yeah. <laughs> so maybe in the future, maybe somebody develops some other theory, and then somebody looks at that theory and says, "Hey, I can use this." To I guess break, I did have a question. Well, well, what uh, spectral graph theory? You use that term. I I don't have a picture of what that is. Well, look, look at it on Wikipedia. I'm, I'm going to send out a link to that. Okay. And uh, you know, I'm not sure what it is exactly either, but there's some nice pictures and descriptions. So. Um, okay. Thanks. Anyway. So, so Tom Foraker, do you have anything to comment on this? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I think spectral graph theory has to do with uh, studying the eigenvalues of the graph. Okay, well, I'm just, anything on the Collatz conjecture or? Stay away or from it. <laughs> Stay away from it. <laughs> Good advice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll add that I Mathewitz also warned to stay away from Fermat's last theorem, and luckily Wiles didn't. He just hid himself for several years. <laughs> well, seven it took, years. Him took him seven years. Yeah, and then there was a gap in and his. It wasn't proof. right. It took another two years to fix that. And, and he he cried after seeing that. <laughs> <laughs> so he anyway. was smart enough to address it, and there's other people that were smart enough that wouldn't have been able to do it and not to address it. That's my. But you don't know which group you're in unless you try. I know which group <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> so John Mejia, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, not too much to the theory. I, 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 so the question was already asked. I wonder where, where this particular problem came from. You know, what, what are the origins of that problem? What was he trying to solve uh, when he came up with that formulation? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the exact thing that how he came across it, I haven't, I haven't seen. So yeah. it's just that he did mention it to mathematicians and therefore he got credit for it. Right, but you know, there's some specificity in, in this formulation that would, that would make you think that it was just a random, a random problem that came up from the sky. Well, I mean, there was this one mathematician called Galwa. He liked to take um, functions of x and divide them into other functions of x. And he came up with this whole thing of Galwa theory. You know, why did he do that? I mean, he was just doodling on a piece of paper saying- You mean Galois you know, fields? Yeah, Galwa fields. He was just okay. doodling on paper yeah. and said, what happens when you do this? And he came up with this whole branch of mathematics. Sure. So, you know, these mathematicians, you know, <laughs> give them a paper and pencil, they come up with new things. <laughs> right. So, anyway. No, he was actually working on a specific problem. He was trying to, um, <clears throat> there, there was a conjecture that uh, for n greater than five, there were no solutions to the ge generic uh, nth degree polynomial equation, something like that. I forget the details. And he worked on it. Uh, and as he was working on it, he essentially was moving things around and doing permutations, and that later became the, a lot of uh, group theory. Uh, but he was he was really working on a specific problem. He didn't get far enough to have a complete proof. He had an outline of a proof, and over the years, other mathematicians filled in the details, and those details became uh, Galois groups and finite field theory, finite group theory. Okay, Th thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, all right, so if nobody else has any further comments, we'll conclude the math interest group meeting. Thank you for attending. <laughs>